Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to this week's eNLA seminar. Um, and for not missing the time change in Europe. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Ulrike Meyer Young, who will uh, give this week's talk. Uh, and uh, I'll give a brief introduction. So Ulrike has um, done her first degree in Germany at the University of Bochum in mathematics, and then uh, moved on to the University of Illinois uh, for a PhD in computer science. And uh, via several um, routes uh, through um, the research center in Jülich in Germany and the supercomputing research labs in Illinois, Uh, she um, ended up at uh, the Lawrence Livermore uh, Labs in um, uh, California. Uh, so she uh, has um, several interests and she's well known for her work in algebraic multigrid and parallel computing. And I believe today she will talk about uh, this work. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, for her to talk about the de developing algebraic multigrid methods for GPUs. Um, before I hand over uh, just a few comments about um, the, the talk, uh, it's streamed onto uh, YouTube and you are um, invited to ask questions also throughout the talks, uh, throughout the talk uh, in the chat. So you can use the chat to ask questions and uh, we can then um, interrupt Ulrike and Ulrike can take a break uh, for having these uh, questions answered and uh, I'll unmute you once you've have, uh, made yourself known that you uh, want to ask a question. So thanks for joining. Uh, thank you, Ulrike, for, uh, uh, for uh, joining us as well. And we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. So um, I want to get right into my talk. And before I get into the actual um, topics, I do want to mention a few people who have contributed quite a bit to the things I'll be talking about right now. And that's Rob Fagu, who actually leads the Scalable Linear Solvers Project and at Lawrence Livermore Lab um, and, and the Hyper Project, which is our software as the Hyper Library. Um, Ruping Lee, who's really our GPU expert there and has done a lot of this. Victor Palo de Marquis is one of our postdocs. He has actually worked on the semi-structured portion I'll be talking about. Um, Ruping is kind of the other guy, also a great mathematician. And Bjorn Stjokrin was responsible for some helped with some of the um, uh, development of new interpolation algorithms for that we are now using in Hyper. Here's the link to Hyper if you want to learn more about the project. And also there are actually more team members on there, which of who of course are also all contribute to Hyper. So, so feel free to go there. Okay, um, so just going back to the background here uh, and the motivation, of course, linear systems are used in, are in appearing in very many uh, different applications. And so Hyper is also used by many application uh, groups. And so here are just a few of them listed where you maybe have to solve a linear system and where you might be able to do this with some algebraic multicut methods. And of course, a lot of times we're talking about very large simulations that want to be run on high performance computers. And so, which is why our focus really in Hyper is to really look at multigrid methods. Multigrid, multi-level methods are really <clears throat> very useful, specifically if you have sparse linear systems, very large sparse linear systems. And in this case, you do not want to use a direct method, you want to use an indirect method. And that's where our multi-good methods are very useful. So of course, one of the reasons multi-good methods are useful is because they're optimal in a way that means if they're well designed um, and you have a system of size n, then you can solve it in O of n operations. 
or here in the case of a weak scaling study when you increase your system size um, and with the number of processes, you do want to have the time to be about constants across. And that can be achieved with multi good methods because you can achieve a, the good convergence. And in other ways, um, the number of iterations might not increase or only increase it slightly, assuming, of course, you have um, done a good job in designing it. And ultimately, this really helps simulations to be solved fast and quickly and leads to better science. So as far as high performance computing is, of course, we do know the race is on. There is, of course, the top 500 we get twice a year, we see. And this isn't really actually an old one. It only goes to 2016. We are already beyond that, but that's the one I have here. And you can see the top computer, how high, how quickly it increases. Um, and um, there was a greater than 500,000 increase in supercomputer performance from between 1994 and 2016. And of course, now we're looking towards exascale computing, um, 10 to the 18 calculations per second here. Um, and one of the first computers to achieve this was Bugaco, um, but using mixed precision benchmarks so far, no machine has reached a double precision um, exascale calculation. I know Summit also was able to do this and probably other machines as well. Um, but of course, we are now looking forward to our first exascale systems. Frontier is being put together as we're speaking. And so hopefully later this year, uh, it will be parts of it will be available. Um, and that's at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and then there are the other two that are coming up is Aurora and El Capitan um, in 2023. Now Frontier and El Capitan are using AMD GPUs. Aurora is using Intel GPUs. And so we'll, soon have exit scale systems. And so obviously hyper needs to run on all kinds of machines. And while this was not our most, ex I mean, at that point, we were not too excited about having to deal with GPUs. Um, obviously with all these GPUs on the rise, we had to do something about it. And one of the issues is that um, if you wanna do well on a GPU, you want to have some very regular compute patterns. And so specifically, if you have structured a structured problem, um, they are more suitable for a GPUs. And of course, our most used um, algebraic multi solver Boom AMG is unstructured. So, so that provided some challenges. However, Hyper does have different interfaces. There are essentially three interfaces. There's a structured, a semi-structured, and a linear algebraic interface. That's the unstructured interface. And, and so there is some potential, additional potential in these other interfaces. So the basic idea behind it is like you could have some kind of problem, um, like coming from a structured problem maybe. And if you can use the structured interface, then you actually have access to some very fast multi solvers, like PFMG is probably our fastest multi solvers, but it requires a completely structured problem here. Um, and then of course you do have semi-structured problems like block structured, et cetera, adaptive mesh refinement also, or completely unstructured problem, in which case you might want to use Boom AMG, our unstructured algebraic multi grid solver, who's, which is probably the most self -sol most used solver among all of them. So um, just one more thing, um, you can actually use through all these interfaces, you can use Boom AMG, but PFMG you can only use through the structured interface. And so we came up with different strategies, essentially, um, for the, the different interfaces. So let me first quickly say something about the structured interface. And in some, in a lot of ways, this was kind of the easiest to move to a GPU. And part of the reason is because the underlying underlying data structures are based on grids and stencils. Um, and so that allows a much easier porting because um, we actually have something called the box loops, which is a macro which allows you to run the loops across these data structures nicely and it's in one part of the code. And so it allows us to um, just include whatever programming model we have underneath, be it CUDA, HIP, et cetera, or any of these other ones um, mentioned here and just put it under the box loops. And then we can get the whole things to run um, on different types of um, architectures, GPU type architectures. Here's an example for using PFMG as a preconditioned PCG that was run on Spark, which has a AMD um, GPUs. Um, and here in this case, it was just run on one node here, but it, just to show, yes, it runs on GPUs. In this case, it was using HIP. 
um, and there are two different types of um, settings for PFMG. Our best one, which uses a non galerkin kind of approach, or the default one. And um, you see here the dashed lines are CPU results and then GPU results here. And what you can see, of course, when if your problem size, in this case, we're looking at a 7.3D Laplace problem on an NQ grid, um, is small. You cannot expect um, this GPU to be faster because you have a lot of overheads, but things get do very well when you increase the problem size. That's actually all I wanted to say about the structured interface at this point, but I do want to move on now to the unstructured part because that's the most used algebraic multi -quid. Um And so what was our strategy for that? Um, so one of the things is, of course, we're dealing with a CSR-based matrix data structure, compressed sparse row, which has a lot of indirection, et cetera. And so that's um, a little harder to deal with and not so nice and regular. Um, and so our after trying other things, we pretty much decided we were just modulizing the code into smaller chunks that we, or kernels that we can then port to CUDA or originally because we first started with NVIDIA GPUs. And then of course, now we can also move to AMD GPUs. That's pretty much done. I mean, you can run it now on, on no problem on um, AMD GPUs. And we are still working on the sickle part um, for Intel GPUs. So, um, and then we also, in some cases, we were thinking about developing new algorithms that were more suitable for GPUs and that particular, the interpolation, we had some issues. And I will explain that better as, as we proceed. We do also have various special solvers on the, that interface like Maxwell solvers, AMS or ADS is for age diff problems, et cetera, Pierre, that's something for highly non-symmetric problems, but they're all built on top of um, Puma AMG. And so anything we do here benefits those as well. And AMS, ADS and AME, that's an eigen solver. Actually, they're all now CUDA enabled and can be run on um, also on um, CUDA, uh, um, on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so algebraic multigrid basically consists of a setup phase and a solve phase. And that's true for all the ones, regardless which interface, including PFMG. So in the setup phase, we do select the coarse grids, which mostly in the unstructured case, we're just determining a graph through the graph of the actually strength matrix, on which points we're gonna, which variables we take to the next uh, coarser level. Um, we define an interpolation. And then often, because we often have symmetric problems, uh, restriction is just the transpose of the interpolation. This also works for a slightly non-symmetric problem often. And then we determine our coarse grid operators. The solve phase, of course, is our typical V cycle. In this case, of course, you can have other cycles, but here, just for the sake of this, where you have a, some smoother, which could be gaussidal or Jacobi, if you really want to have something more parallel, which, of course, we do want. You compute your residual as here given, you strict it to your next um, course, the level, and then you solve that you have a new system now um, for the error, essentially, which you can either solve or you continue with this kind of a procedure here. And then eventually you interpolate back up, add your um, int uh, the interpolated values to your, you correct your um, approximation and then you can relax again, et cetera. So that's the basic idea. So as you can see, we already have here, at least we have a lot of different kernels included. And so doing the GPU implementation for the implementation for the solve phase was actually pretty straightforward. We've done it a long time ago, and this was already working for quite a while. Especially when you smooth us, if you have a Jacobi type smoothers or polynomial smoothers, they're all based on matrix vector multiplications. So if you have a good matrix vector multiplications, which is usually given by all the vendors for any of these um, GPU type architectures, then you can actually implement this very well on um, for a GPU. Obviously, this is algebraic multi -quid, so you still have issues when you go to coarser levels, you end up with smaller problems and eventually this won't be that efficient on, on, on the GPU, but uh, so far um, it's, it's working well. So The harder part was really the setup phase. So um, what's the setup phase here? I've just listed it again. I went through it over. And what do we do underneath? So we have something like a strength matrix. We first generate, that's highly parallel. There's no issue there. The strength matrix essentially determines which of the coefficients we consider important in A. So I will say a little bit more when I talk about interpolation about that, what, how this is actually defined. But for right now, this is fine. Um, we implement a, uh, our, actually right now, the only um, coarsening algorithm we have is PMIS, which is highly parallel. That's the only one we have implemented on the GPU. Um, and that works very well. It's easy to be, was fairly 
straightforward to be implemented. Well, I should ask or ping how easy it really was. Uh, and then the triple matrix product, if you do have an efficient matrix matrix multiplication, which generally sparse matrix matrix are also give, delivered by the vendors, um, then this is okay too. We don't have to worry about it. Although I have to say um, right now, the hyper implementation is still better than um, the current CUDA implementation. So uh, for CUDA. Um, the AMD one is pretty good. So, and then the real the real issue we had was interpolation. So let me just say a few things about interpolation and and, and also explain why this was a problem. First of all, here's the definition of strength threshold. So it says I strongly depends on J if you have if this inequality is fulfilled, where you have a strength threshold of theta here. And of course, this was originally really motivated by M matrices, which usually we have, and we still use it. I know there have been other efforts made in between to define different um, ways of strengths to define the strengths in a different way, but we still use this. And generally, it works pretty well. Um, so then here, just a few notations. When you for neighborhoods here, if this is your um, ice point, then you might have fine. In this case, um, solid lines are strong connections, that dotted lines are weak connections, and then red points are fine points, black points are coarse points. And so, and then of course, we do have different neighborhoods here. So AMG interpolation was essentially motivated by wanting to make sure that after you relax, what you really want is that your error, A times the error is approximate zero because you want to smooth um, errors quickly, right? And so you do want to make sure that um, your interpolation does also satisfy this. And so your interpolation formula should satisfy the following, um, well, sort of equation. And uh, one, Interpolation that does this is direct interpolation. This was actually, you can find this in Klaus Steuben's paper. Um, and this is probably the simplest one. It's not a very good one, but it's actually ideal for GPUs. So that was the first one we actually implemented. But the problem is, especially in combination with PMIS, it doesn't scale very well when you increase your problem size. So um, a better interpolation, which we did not implement on, on GPU at this point, is the classical one, which does this in terms of some stencil collage. Col collapsing. And what you can see, it also includes the weak connection, which were co completely ignored up here, um, and does some additional more complex kind of um, computation and gives you some better um, if you have the right coarsening in combination. So um, because we didn't like direct interpolation um, already way back, and when we decided to use the PMIS coarsening, we needed to have a better interpolation than the classical one, but we decided to just extend it. And so the what we call the extended interpolation was the extension we made is we just increased our coarse neighborhood by including coarse points that were um, neighbors of strong fine connections like here. And so that kind of changed our formula in the following way. I mean, it also made things kind of more complicated because, for example, you might have a course point here, um, which before was just weakly connected to I, and now suddenly um, this weak connection became more important and was included and over here instead of here, et cetera, et cetera. And that required to do a lot of if and, and whatnot connections in there. Um, on top of it, you might get a weak connection over here to, uh, and, and so on. So this was kind of complicated. And that was one of the reasons why we were not able to just easily port the current implementation we had back over to, um, to on it, onto a GPU. So one of the things we thought about is looking at this is, well, this looks kind of like the matrix matrix multiplication. How can we express this in terms of matrix matrix multiplications? And yes, you can do something actually. Um, sort of. Um, so if you go ahead and consider A and just distribute um, your points in terms of fine and coarse points, like here, in this case, reorder this, you can kind of take A and, and divide it into a diagonal, a strength connection and, and the weak connections. Uh, and then you can also define your interpolation as W and, and here the identity for the coarse points also. You can further then generate um, the strong parts of AFF and AFC up here. And then you can also de define some diagonal matrices, very simple ones. A D beta is just the row sums of your AFCS, the strong portion up here. DFF is your diagonal of AFF. And then DW is the row sum of all the weak co coefficients across here. 
And then you can actually define W in the following way as minus DFF plus DW inverse times AFFS plus D beta times this. So essentially it's just two matrices you can multiply with each other. And that is you can actually implement very nicely on the GPU. So that works great. So let's just go back to our original kind of um, other um, definition we had. So this is, if we write it in the same way as before, this is um, our weight as before. Let's compare this to the extended interpolation that we had before. And you will see that it's actually not the same. So they're not exactly the same, they're different. And if we go back to the figure that I showed you earlier, then I can show you in that example that I had how this actually changes. This is what happens with the old extended interpolation. This is with the new one, which we actually call MM extended interpolation because it's based on matrix matrix multiplications. And what you can see, for example, that this weak connection here, which suddenly was included into our strong connections here stays weak because we have, we have CKS. So we only look at the strong connections of the point K here. And so this totally falls away. So really these two are different. Um, this extended interpolation was actually not the one we usually recommended to our users, but that was the way, the one easier to explain how this worked. We actually have an extended plus I interpolation, which we, which in a lot of cases works a little bit better, gives you a little better convergence. And so with the difference between extended and extended plus I is that now we actually also include um, the following connection from a strong point back to point I. So this kind of adds these following things to our extended plus I interpolation and our A8 I tilde actually also includes this whole additional new thing. And one of the problems with this is that actually in order to get that connection, you have to uh, access, um, you have to get the column essentially of, um, of I, which when you have a CSR format, it's hard to get where, um, you only have the rows within one process. You can also express this, turns out you can also express this in terms of matrix matrix multiplication. It's a little more complicated. So now a D beta, which before was just the row sum of AFCS, now has to include the ith column of AFS. And so you can write it this way. The problem with this is now, of course, that D beta I depends on I, which we didn't have before. And so in order to get that information, you actually have to do some communication. You have to communicate whole rows of different adjacent processes um, to be able to find this. And then you have to search this. Then you can generate an AFFS hat matrix by the following equation that fulfills the following thing, which again, it turns, it requires communication, of course, but it, it's not quite as complicated as it might look. You determine your D theta, which is essentially the diagonal, the diagonal matrix, which contains the diagonal of AFS hat with AFFS. And again, this is not as expensive as look because you don't need to compute the whole product. You only need the diagonal of it. And then you can, you can write W in the following um, terms and you're able to also express this in terms of a matrix matrix multiplication. Of course, it does require a lot more communication. And so we came up one additional one, which we call this one, we call MM extended plus I, which we call extended plus E, where we actually try to replace um, the estimate of this kind of connection by just the average of all the strong connections here in the following way. And this allows us then to do this locally on, within a process and then just send one this result over and severs this whole rows and we don't have to do the searching. So that's another option for this one. So we have now three new um, interpolation matrices. So how do they actually compare to our original ones since um, they are not exactly the same? So here we did some experiments using AMG as a solver without, so not as a preconditioner. Um, for um, seven different problems here. The 2D problems is the first for isotropic five point and a nine point stencil. And we also looked at NS rotated, and uh, rotated anisotropies by 45 and 60 degrees. This one specifically is a hard one for um, AMG. Um, and the, some 3D problems, seven point, 27 point, and a problem which had a lot of jumps in it. And what you can see here, if you hear over here are the old methods and over here are the new methods, when you actually compare, um, you, you, for once you can also see why extended plus I in some cases actually works better than the extended, particularly when you have an isotropies, a rotated an isotropies. Um, but you see overall, they do quite well compared to the other ones in some cases, even a little bit better. So, but, so, so yes, um, things are fine. Um, these are some good 
So I'll show you some results here that we actually ran with our GPU implementation. This was run on, on Larsen, one of our um, machines, which has four um, NVIDIA GPUs per node. We ran it here on 16 nodes and we compared it to an MPI implementation on the CPU using um, full MPI, so 40 MPI per node. And what you can see here, this is a couple 3D Poisson problem with three variables on a grid of size n cube. But the system size is three n cube and it's about 375,000 to 3 million degrees of reading per GPU. Um, uh, and you can see here how um, these changes, uh, the um, how well it performs. GPU in red here. In blue is when you we have an apples to apples comparison, just using the same methods here, the new interpolation operators on the CPU also. And then here, this is the old one. So you see, we even got an, a performance uh, improvement here um, on the CPU using the new methods. So again, um, here's the, the speed ups here. We got the total speed ups about 3.1 over the original one here and 3.8 over here. Or if you want to look at it in, in terms of speed up on setup versus solve, then you can see here the setup. It's, we do get some speed up. It's not as much, however, but the solve is actually performs really well. So, so now, however, this is not really the only one. Usually we recommend our users to use aggressive coarsening. So aggressive coarsening, um, because one of the issues with if you don't use, if you just use PMS for some of the problems, you still get very bad um, complexities and it becomes very expensive. So, um, and so just to, to say a, a few things about aggressive coarsening, it essentially consists of two stages. So in our case here, assume this is your, you coarsen, in the first stage, you coarsen just like you would normally use, apply PMS to your, um, graph, um, and then you coarsen just the course, the original course points, and you get an, an additional number of new fine points, we call them just CX here. And that's essentially aggressive coarsening. Now, if you do this, you do need a, um, a more long range interpolation. In this example, we have some points here, which are further than, than distance two away, um, but you can have, usually will have more of these issues, especially depending how you choose your strength threshold, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to have an interpolation that can do more that, that just interpolates from points that are more than distance two away. So, And so uh, one of the ones we actually implemented first on the GPU was, which is the one which we call um, two-stage interpolation. So essentially you take advantage of the two stages. So what you do is you, in the first stage, you essentially here use the same algorithm we did before um, for the first um, coarsening. Um, and then when you, the second part, you just do compute an interpolation for the second part as given here. And then you just multiply these two with each other. So again, this is based on matrix matrix multiplications. And here, if you use our previous ways of expressing it, as I said before, in the first stage, you just have this. In the second stage, you have to focus on this portion here of the matrix. I'm not getting into the details here, um, but we have we rewrote a paper that's been published in CISC, so you can take a look at that if you want more. However, the, the matrix, uh, the, the long-range interpolation that we usually have recommended to our users is multipass interpolation, which originally was um, described by Carl Stuben in his paper on AMG. And here, um, and it, as the name says, goes across different passes. So for this example here, um, essentially our passes are first you start with the course points, then you do the red points are is your second pass. These are all these from one point, uh, one distance one away from your course points, and then you keep going. So your third pass here of two, etc., until you have received an. an an interpolation for all the different points. So how does this work? So I'm assuming F0 is, is our C point. So P0, our original component of P uh, that only is uh, record according to the, is of course just the identity because these are just the course points. And then you proceed, you extract the rows in A that are associated with Fi minus one. So in this case of F1, um, you multiply that portion, that new matrix Ai minus one with Pi minus one, which gives you an Ai tilde. And then you apply direct interpolation to this to generate Pi and you keep going until you're done. And then just insert all the Pi into P and you have your multipass interpolation. Again, this is also a matrix matrix multiplication. And we I already mentioned direct interpolation is very nice on GPU. Of course, this is, is not quite qualitatively as good as the 
the two-stage interpolation. So you can see here, these are the green points that interpolate only from one C point for this example. So you see there are a lot um, more of these points. And of course, diode interpolation is not as good as um, our distance to interpolation operators. So it's what you would expect. So let me show you some examples. As I said before, we have implemented all this that's available now in, uh, in Hyper. You can use them and you can run them both on a, a, an NVIDIA as well as AMD GPUs, it works there. But these results here will all run on Lassen. In this case, I just used two nodes. Um, again, the same problem we looked at earlier in this case, um, the problem is just bigger. So we have a 750,000 to 8 million degrees of reading per GPU. Um, and what, what I did as before, here we use 80 MPI tests where the CPU runs. Um, and we use, again, we do an apples to apples comparison. So what you see here, the CPU 2S means two stage interpolation and MP is multi-pass interpolation. Um, so we can compare these. And what happened here, this is just a set of times. So what you see in all cases, like if you're just on the CPU, multi-pass gives you the best set of times, and that's still true on the GPU. Um, and the worst times as expected, because you get a high complexities are again on for the, um, if you don't do, do any aggressive coarsening, and then of course, two stage interpolations in between. What we also see here in this example is the GPU doesn't have as much memory. So we do get affected by this here. So while we still get a result, it takes forever. So you really don't wanna do this. So, and, and this is where actually multi-pass interpolation really helps because now you see you use less memory. So in that way, it's more memory efficient. Let's take a look at the solve times here. And now here we have the solve times again, um, obviously because here we ran out of memory, so we couldn't even run this one anymore. For multipass, it still worked, but we know the setup was really slow. Um, but what would you see here now that while originally just using no aggressive coarsening is even faster because it converges faster overall, you do pay for doing aggressive coarsening in terms of number of iterations. But we see that ultimately the two-stage interpolation gives you better performance here for both and multi-pass is worse. So you do get, um, it's converged slower. So that's the solve phase. So depending what's more important to you, where you actually want to use AMG. And then finally here, these are the total times combined. And so what you see here is overall, once you get to the larger problems, multi-pass interpolation does work better for total times. But again, it depends what type of problems you want to solve. If you have a time dependent problem, you maybe want to set up only a few times and not, um, and so, so it might be of interest to that your solve phase works better. So again, or if you're really lucky and only have to set up once, then then you might actually want to use one or two stage interpolation or something like that. So okay, so this is what I wanted to just say about the um, unstructured portion before and before I go on, I don't know if there were any questions so far that I can answer before I get to our semi-structured efforts. I know there's some things in the, somebody said they had a question, so. Okay, since I don't hear anything, I'll just keep going. Uh, hello, sorry, it just took a minute for me to unmute. Yeah, um, sorry, I had to I had to unmute and, um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, on the, it, on the, Performance results. What what smoothers were you using? Oh yeah, I was using L1. What? No, for this one, what was I actually using? Let me go. Um, I was using Jacoby, weighted Jacoby actually, uh, with 0.5, with a weight of 0.5 for those. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you you go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so um, so obviously um, we are talking about unstructured so far, you know. So um, as I said before, you can get better results using structure, and so um, so for example, if we kind of compare our PFMG performance to AMG performance, this is for a seven point three D Laplace problem. This was again run on Lassen here. Um, this. You can see here down in red, uh, the PFMG results are much faster. We do get a better speed up here, 6.0, and that's end problem here versus over here with 2.8. And so we do have a lot more um, 
we do have a, a lot more potential using structured problems and uh, using structured solvers. But as I said before, PFMG is limited to the structured interface. And so now we're actually working towards a semi-structured algebra and multi grid method can take advantage of structure. So um, again, as I said before, the semi-structured inter interface allows you to do some block structured grid problems or structured adaptive mesh refinement, et cetera. It also has some finite element capabilities. And so our strategy for this one was actually, um, we want to have, um, so just say a few words about the matrix under the um, semi-structured interface. It consists of two parts, the structured portion and the unstructured portion. So assuming you have, um, like here you have a block structured grid or here you have an adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so inside each part, so here in this case, this would be the part, this would be the part in here, this is completely structured. Um, so you can take advantage of the structured um, data structure that I mentioned before in this, in this uh, structured interface. And then the unstructured portion generally is fairly small because it's just sort of what binds the parts together. Uh, it might have some additional kind of uh, things that are there like um, boundary points, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and so we're actually working right now on redesigning our semi-structured interface to also add re rectangular structured matrices. Um, that's actually in the structured interface. We didn't use to have rectangular matrices there. And so that's obviously important since um, interpolation restriction all rectangular matrices, et cetera. And, um, and so we are also working on the semi-structured algebraic multi solver. So um, just to go back to PFMG, so you get some idea of what uh, is behind uh, the, the new semi-structured algebraic multigrid. So I said before, the A is defined in terms of grids and stencils. So we do know the grid at the beginning. Um, then it uses semi-coarsening um, for coarsening PFMG. And then it uses such a very two, simple two-point interpolation, which essentially assume you take this point, it just interpolates from these two points next to it because it's semi-coarsening. And the nice thing about this is that this really limits your stencil growth for your coarse grid operator P transpose AP. Um, so, so in 2D, you get to at most nine point and at most 27 point in 3D, which is very different from our boomerang where you can have very large stencil growth. We also have a non galerking approach, which even preserves the stencil size. So in the 3D would keep it to seven points actually. And then we use a pointwise smoother. And this is really efficient for suitable problems as you can imagine. So, and as you've seen in, in the previous slide. Um, so, so we wanted to use this kind of approach to, to um, create a semi-structured algebraic multi grid method. And so as this is as very simple actually, as follows, um, assuming A is our matrix, it consists of a structured and an unstructured part. Um, then we generate our interpolation and now we only focus on the structured portions. Um, so PS is essentially just a matrix, a two point matrix within, like what I said before, our restriction as the transpose of PS. And then of course we have to adjust the weights at the boundaries to make sure that this still um, approximates constants as needed. And then we generate a coarse grid operator, AC, by just multiplying as you usually would do. And again, we have a structured and unstructured part, um, which is nice. And you can even show that um, with that two point interpolation, the UC part will stay restricted to the part boundary. So it doesn't grow into the interior, although it, it will grow, but it stays on the part boundaries. And then you can just use a weighted Jacobi smooth or something to this. And that's essentially our algorithm. Let's look at some test problems. These were just run on a sequential problem. We just wanted to see how this converges. And we essentially look at four problems now. Um, in this first case, we have this two, um, this, this grid consists of two parts here and where we look at an isotropic and an, an anisotropic with a 0.01 um, anisotropy. Um, then we look, looked at a mixed anisotropy problem here where we actually have a, using anisotropous 0.01 in different directions here. And finally, we also look at an AMR problem. And we compare this uh, where we have a small um, box here included and a big ones. And we compare this to PFMG CG on the whole domain. Obviously we cannot use PFMG on this problem here, but we can sort of use it here by assuming we, this is just one domain and see how these compare. 
So here, the 2D case, you can see the number of iterations. Um, here, um, SSAMG does work sort of. We increase the problem size um, here by in this n case, 2D n by n here to 128. And so, yes, we do see some growth over here more than over here, and it doesn't work quite as well, but it's still sort of OK. Um, for the anisotropic problem, we see more increase compared to PFMG, but again, this is still reasonable. The mixed problem, actually PFMG fails on this one, but SSMG does okay, and then it does work on the AMR problem. And then we do the same thing for 3D, and in 3D, actually, the difference isn't as bad as in the 2D case. So we consider that a pretty um, encouraging result. And so now we actually have implemented this method on 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 the CPU so far, not on the GPU yet. And so I wanted, um, this is still work in progress. It's not completely optimized, but we have made a lot of progress compared to last time when I talked about this. And, but you still keep this in mind. So here, the first problem we look at is a block structured grid consists of four parts here. Um, and we're just increasing the number of processes. And so the system size is varying from 1 million to 128 million. Um, and, uh, to see how this performs. So you see here the number of iterations does grow a bit, but it, it's reasonable here, it's not too bad. And uh, here are the times we got. So, so we get pretty good um, scalability so far, so that's good. But let's take a look at a little bit more complicated problem. So here is a 2D, 3D mix and isotropy. And this was run on the Power9, like the, the example before also was run on the Power9, um, actually. Um, so two cores before we had one to 128 cores. And here, because our real competitor on the semi-structured interface is actually not um, PFMG because that doesn't work there, but it's BoomerMG because BoomerMG works on it. And right now people that are using the semi-structured interface are actually using BoomerMG to solve their problems if they want to use an ultra multi-grid method there. And so let's take a look on this one. This is, um, as I said, two, so each, uh, each part is, is run in parallel between the two. And here, the total grid size was 192 um, cube. And we used for AMG, we used PMIS coarsening and L1 Jacobi for both. Um, for both of them, we used L1 Jacobi underneath. Um, and we used different type settings for AMG because there are many of them. And just keep also in mind, AMG is fully optimized as SMG, we're still working on it. But this is already an encouraging result, actually. So what we do see here, um, Convergent, so AMG 4 point, that's pretty much using the default interpolation settings here. In this case, because SSAMG uses semi coarsening, so we essentially have a two point interpolation. So we decided here to just restrict uh, the interpolation to two points. And keep also in mind, because we use semi coarsening, we have a lot more levels in SSAMG than we do have in AMG generally. Um, and finally, we also compare this to using aggressive coarsening since generally we do tell people this is um, the, the method we look at. I mean, this is what we usually recommend for a lot of um, diffusion type problems because you actually better times, not better convergence, but better times generally because it's it's more efficient in, with regard to memory, a number of, of operations actually. So what we see here, um, convergence is a little worse. It's actually better than using aggressive coarsening over here. And overall, we do get the best times here. So that's good. Let's take a look at another problem here. In this case, that's an AMR problem. So we have here, and we, it's a 3D one. So it's 128 times 128 times 128 per part. So we have actually two cubes that are nested in each, each other here. And we do use PMIS coarsening, um, again, an L1 Jacobi. Um, so what we see here, um, this is sequential at first. Uh, so we do see here, um, again, better convergence here. These ones here are fairly similar, so that's not too bad. But overall, we do benefit from the data structure being more suitable um, for this type of problems. And so there is some improvement. Now running the same thing on, on um, two cores here, so have these two things running in parallel. We do see here that our setup times here increase. So we have some real issues here with, it, with communication for these problems apparently here, but it's okay here with uh, using the one level of aggressive coarsening. Um, so we do see here again, um, this is, gives you really good performance. And then I increased this also increased for the same type of problem um, or actually run this on a, 
essentially on a larger type of problem here. Um, again, increase the number of processes by a factor of eight. So now we run it on 16 cores um, on a system size eight times as big as before here. Um, so this is actually not true here, <laughs> just because we increased that. So I should have changed that here too. It's not 128 by 128 anymore. Um, and so we see here, again, we're still faster with SSAMG, but now um, the setup time wasn't quite as favorable. And I think part of the issue here is we, one of the things we still have to work on is the, the parallel implementation. So we have to do work some more on the MPI portion of um, this. So uh, to get better performance, um, one of the things we looked into and we have to look deeper into is that the unstructured portion still sometimes causes more time than we would like to have. Um, and so there's still a lot, quite a bit of work to do here, but at least we have some initial results. So, so, so I'm, this is pretty much it. So I'm at the end here. So to kind of just summarize. So on the first part is essentially what really helped us to implement um, the unstructured Boom AMG on, on GPUs was the development of these um, interpolation operators based on matrix matrix multiplication and using the modularization, which really helps us for performance portability also follow on the new um, machines coming up, different types of GPUs. Um, I mentioned before, we do have HIP support now on AMG, so you can run it on AMD GPUs. Hopefully um, Intel GPUs won't be that far off, but that's still, a lot of work in progress. And it turns out HIP is closer to CUDA. So that was the easier part actually to do. Sickle is a little bit more different. So we'll see how that goes. Um, as far as the semi-structured um, algebraic multi-quid, we saw a lot of potential, but we still have to work more on this. We have to continue optimizing the code. Um, and of course, there are still some bugs and performance issues, um, especially with regard to parallel performance. Uh, down the road, we do expect that we have to work more on interpolation than just um, interpolating on the structured part and ignoring the unstructured portion is probably not good enough. So we will probably have to somewhat include the unstructured portion into interpolation depending on the type of problems we look at. And um, as far as the GPU implementation, of course, that's our big goal that we want to make sure that this will work on the GPU. Um, I assume that the structured portion should be pretty straightforward. Again, for the reasons we still use the box loops, as I mentioned before, but then we also have to make sure that the unstructured part and the structured part work well together on the GPU also. So I expect there's a lot more work to be done and we haven't really, we haven't really tried to attack this so far. So, and that's pretty much all I wanted to say so far here. I just do want to credit all the different um, institutions that have provided us with funds so we were able to do this work and thank you all for listening thank you very much um uh, for for your talk um i i saw a, a question by uh, aditya kashi so i'm going to unmute unmute you and then uh, you can ask your question Hey, uh, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, my question was about, uh, I think I might have missed this, so sorry if that is the case. Um, why do you always use the semi-coarsening for SSAMG and why is it not an option to use full coarsening? Uh, actually, you can simulate full coarsening um, by skipping levels, but you still, because it's really based on, on, on the PFMG, which uses semi-coarsening. That's the way you get to the next levels. Um, so in a way, um, how can you uh, imitate full coarsening is you still have to do this in the setup. You still have to go from level to level, but you can skip uh, levels when you actually um, do the smoothing. And we actually have that options in there. For the runs I showed you, I used, um, I did not use a skip option because we, there were some issues and it didn't work right and didn't converge. So as I said, there's still bugs we have to fix. Um, but yeah, so that's the way you would do it. Now I have to say the setup is actually fairly cheap compared to, to Boomer MG, you know, so, but that's the way the algorithm works. It just is based on semi coarsening Can you select the direction along Long which you want to semi coarsen or? Well, there is actually, there is some, PFMG has some automated um, things built in. So it sort of de determines based on the coefficients, et cetera, in which direction it should go. Uh, so that is is built in. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and there is one more question. And I, unfortunately, there's no first name, but I just unmute, um, read, and then you can, you can ask. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you have, um, I know this is early work, so this might change as you continue working on this, but have you, have you and your team profiled this code and found out what, where it's spending most of its time? Um, has that changed from CPU to GPU, for example? Are you seeing any like surprises there? Well, we haven't. Well, right now we are still working on CPU, right? So, I mean, what, which one you're talking about now? Which code, the semi-structured one or the unstructured one? I mean. Um, well, how about unstructured? Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm curious about all of it, but in the, um, don't want to take too much time with one question. Um, so we do have done some profiling, you know, of course. Um, Based on, on what I've seen, yes, sometimes things do change a bit, right? Um, for example, where you, on a CPU usually, um, well, the GPU, like in the cell phase, for example, when you have, when you don't use aggressive coarsening, you can get a much faster solve in some of the cases because um, even so you use more memory because the GPU is just really fast compared to the CPU. And that's one, one example where you actually do see um, different behavior on the GPU versus on the CPU. But um, of course, there is the, still the issue of GPU doesn't have as much memory usually as a CPU. And then um, ultimately you might still end up using the more memory efficient version that you also used on the CPU. The overall um, profiling, we did some of that. Of course, we do this to try to improve things. Uh, mostly this was more in terms of trying to get rid of copies on the GPU. Other than that, I can't really tell you the difference actually. So I don't know if there was more going on with regard to comparison to the two. Um, some of it is, is actually overall in the end, I think it's, it's sort of similar to what I expect to see on the CPU. Thank you. Um, I see no more questions, but let me take the liberty to ask a question myself. On your first part of uh, your talk, um, when you presented the results for the convergence, this ANUS 60 problem was really difficult. Uh, as a non-expert of AMG, can you explain to me what the difficulty is? I think it's the direction. It's just not, it does well on the 45 degree. I'm trying to get that sort of angle seems to be really hard to do for AMG. Now, mm -hmm. obviously you saw, um, well, I probably forgot to mention that, that the, once you use it as a preconditioner, that problem goes away and you still get good convergence, still right. worse than for the 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. But it seems like by itself, AMG doesn't work well on that. Now I should say generally we use AMG as a preconditioner because it seems like combining it with a Krylov method is really helpful to overcome some of these problems. Um, it's, so they sort of complement each other. So um, yeah. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, don't see any more questions. So um, uh, let me take the opportunity to thank you again, uh, Ulrike Young, for um, this talk. I'm going to clap for everybody. Um, and uh, before I finish uh, the meeting, I'll hopefully I can share the screen. Um, share the screen and advertise. Yeah, hopefully you can see this, advertise the next uh, talk. So uh, you can see here today's talk. And uh, the next talk is in two weeks time by uh, Lek Heng Lim. And um, he'll talk about randomized linear algebra. And, um, and then we have uh, a few more talks until uh, the holidays. So thank you again for joining us um, at this uh, Central European time instead of uh, summertime. And uh, have a good um, rest of the week. Thank you.